Welcome, friends. <laughs> Happy to have you join us for our first Monday program of the winter. We're going to be hosting programs on Mondays through our last one will be March 22nd, uh, just for the winter series. So if you're interested in the entire schedule, it's on the yellow sheet on the counter. I'm Susan Rower with the Washington State Capitol Museum, and I welcome you on behalf of the museum and the Washington State Historical Society. The programs are always at noon on Mondays, and we will have a spring series as well that will begin in April. Before I have the privilege of introducing my friend and colleague, Lauren Danner, I would like to point out to you another uh, program that we're very excited about that's coming up and is listed on the purple sheet on the counter and that will be the opening of a new exhibit created for this museum which is something we haven't done in a while and the title of that exhibit is From Parlor to Podium Territorial Suffragists of Olympia. It opens on March 13th and we'll go a little over a year. Our uh, state coordinator, Shannon Stevenson, who's here today, is the chief curator of this exhibit and will have a very uh, nice opening, large event on Saturday, March 13th. And I hope everyone will hope to join us and be here for that special exhibit. Uh, I have had the privilege of working with Lauren since she joined the State Historical Society in 2003. We were just trying to put a date on that and it seemed to me that we really weren't functioning as well before Lauren was here. It's hard to imagine the museum and the Historical Society without Lauren as part of it. In fact, I, I have a hard time remembering exactly how we succeeded in those days without you, Lauren. Uh, it's also hard to write an introduction for Lauren that does justice to her career and her personal accomplishments. I don't want to be too effusive, but it has been a real privilege to be a colleague of Lauren since that time. She joined, Lauren joined the State Historical Society in 2003 when she was appointed by our state director, David McCandry, to be the coordinator for the Lewis and Clark Bicentennial Commemoration in Washington State. Of, of course, that was a national event and three-year program, but during that time as the Washington State Coordinator, Lauren accumulated accolades across the state, the region, and the national history stage. During the bicentennial, Lauren calculated she probably put 30,000 miles on our state car in three years. I put down that you made your own version of the trail crossing in Washington and assisted on programs from uh, the Tri-Cities to Pacific County. And another important aspect of that work was to maintain Washington State vision for this national commemoration and work with not only our local citizenry but also the state tribes who were very involved in the commemoration in those three years. Following or concurrently actually with that position, our director didn't feel that was quite enough so he went ahead and appointed Lauren as the State History Day Coordinator. Now, in 2005, Washington State Historical Society assumed the operation or management of that program. It had been going on here in Washington for a number of years, but it has really come to the forefront under the leadership of Lauren Danner and her team. The coordination began in 2005 with 3,000 students. It has grown by 60%, which is a real uh, credit to Lauren and Mark Vesey for their efforts in making this a great program for our students. We're now looking at 5,400 children or students uh, participating every year. And this role has taken Lauren across the country. She is also not only the state coordinator for Washington, but the regional representative to the National History Day Executive Board, which is a terrific um, a Terrific credit and compliment to your hard work, Lauren. Lauren's career has also included staffing the Heritage Caucus, which is a nationally recognized program for the State Historical Society during the legislative session. So she'll begin to, to staff that this week. 
uh, for this session, and she has provided to our agency expertise in the area of policy and performance, and lately has taken on new challenges, including being the co-author of the State Historical Society's blog. So when you read, if you can sign up and uh, listen and read that blog, you'll enjoy it. Lauren has stepped up and is developing some new credentials in the arena of exhibit curatorship. Now that's a, that, Lauren tells me, is something new for her. And she is developing a new exhibit for the State History Museum in Tacoma on the environmental challenges Mount Rainier is facing against the backdrop of its long history as a site for recreation, natural abundance, and importance to our Native communities. Lauren received her PhD from the University of Oregon, and she studied and researched the history of the proposed North Cascades National Park, and it is my honor to welcome I, there's just no way I can live up to that introduction at all. <clears throat> so um, I did want to thank Sue and the State Capitol Museum for inviting me to speak, and Mark, who's out with the cash box, for um, helping with the maps that you will see here. I'm not a professional map maker, and so these look a little hand-drawn. That's because they are. Um, the research that I'm going to present today was um, first published in Columbia Magazine not the most recent issue, but the one before. And if you, at the end of the day, feel like you need even more information on Ice Peaks National Park, that we have Columbia's for sale back there. Um, and also, uh, I wanted to thank uh, our research center, the Washington State History Research Center, which is part of the State Historical Society, for providing some of the images, and the State Historical Society in general, because it's a great place to work, and I'm very lucky to be here. So this is the story of a national park that wasn't, and probably never had a real chance of being established. But it's a great example of how the power of suggestion can lay the groundwork for future change and of early environmental politics in Washington state. Um, in the 1930s, an enormous national park was proposed for Washington. It would have covered the crest of the Cascade Range from the Canadian border to the Columbian River. And the proposal died, but it did leave a legacy in a national park, several wilderness areas, and several recreation areas that exist today. So first, uh, some background. The Cascades have been proposed for national park status um, numerous times since the late 1800s. In 1899, a memorial to Congress asked that the entire Cascades summit be set aside, not necessarily as a park, but somehow preserved. Um, also that year, Mount Rainier National Park was established, and depending on how you calculate it, it was the nation's fifth or seventh national park. And it's worth noting that Rainier was created 17 years before the National Park Service came into existence. Um, Rainier is much more a result of Seattle and Tacoma's desire for economic engine in tourism than any desire to preserve wilderness, big trees, or ecological habitats. So just know that right up. This was definitely something like, oh, we think this is a great tourist opportunity. Let's set the mountain aside. And they got the federal government on board with that. In 1906, Lake Chelan was preserved, uh, proposed for a national park. And a couple of views. I should just stop here and say that most of my pictures are just pictures of mountains because that's what this whole presentation is about. And what's more fun than spending a rainy afternoon looking at slides of beautiful mountains? Um, Mount Baker was proposed for a national park in 1908 and also each year from 1916 to 1921, Mount Baker. The Yakima Commercial Club thought that Mount Adams would make a fine park in 1919 and in 1920. The Trails Club of Oregon suggested um, Mount St. Helens for a park. That's not Mount St. Helens. In 1920, there was another suggestion for a Cascade Summit Park. This is the Southern Pickets in the North Cascades. And in 1929, a well-known conservationist recommended that at least two or three more national parks be created in the Washington and Oregon Cascades. A number of these proposals can be linked directly to the enthusiasm inspired by the creation of the National Park Service in 1916. Uh, but the land under proposal was often under the management of another federal agency, the US Forest Service. And to really understand 
the conflict over land management in the Cascades, it is necessary to have some background on the major agencies in charge of it, the Forest Service and the National Park Service. Um, the Forest Service was established in 1905 to manage 63 million acres of national forest reserves around the country that had been set aside in 1891 in response to very nascent concerns about overharvesting timber. Very nascent, very early concerns. It was placed in the Department of Agriculture, and that reflects the view that trees were a crop to be managed using the best science available. And this is where the phrase, the greatest good for the greatest number in the long run originates. And the Forest Service used the principle of multiple use in its management. And what that meant is that forests were seen as having multiple purposes, economic, utilitarian, recreational. In principle, any given forest, according to the Forest Service, could be used simultaneously for timber, grazing, recreation, watershed management, and so on. In reality, this concept proved largely unworkable, and the Forest Service has always struggled to apply it even-handedly. Um, the other important thing to know about the Forest Service is that the way it was set up, it was decentralized with decisions made by local foresters who were usually hired from the surrounding communities and benefiting the local economy was of paramount importance in forest management. The National Park Service, on the other hand, was created to centralize management of an ever-growing number of national parks and monuments. And you've probably all seen the PBS special or series or part of it. So maybe this is not going to be news to you anymore. Um, but its first director, Steve Mather, used really slick advertising campaigns to bring people to the parks and to generate political support. He himself was a CEO of a very successful business. He understood marketing nationally, and he used all of those tactics to bring people to the parks. Um, his goal was simple. His tactics were effective. Make the national parks America's playground. And he worked with the railroads to bring people to the parks. And these are some uh, brochures that were published by different railroads to get people to the parks. These are all Northwest parks. Um, and with the rise of the automobile, he pioneered the notion of putting roads through the most scenic parts of the park. So when you go to what people call a crown jewel national park, like a Zion or a Bryce or Yosemite, you know, you'll often see there's one or two roads that go through the most gorgeous areas of the park. And that was very intentional on Mather's part. So, both agencies, though, had to deal with conflicts inherent in their respective responsibilities. The Forest Service was supposed to manage the forest, but public pressure led the agency to start setting aside certain areas for recreation and scenery as early as the 1910s. Um, and the Park Service's mission was to both preserve superlative natural areas on the one hand and at the same time make them accessible to the public. And that has constantly led to friction in the national parks about what gets preserved and what is, make, is made accessible. Um, by the mid-1920s, these agencies wielded roughly equivalent political clout. The Forest Service's main concern at that time was the removal of forest lands to be made into national parks. And the Park Service was actively looking for forest lands to convert. Um, a gain by one was a loss to the other. So the par par Park Service's preferred tactic was to ask for an enormous chunk of land, and then settle for less, but still get some. And then a few years later, it would ask for another huge chunk, and then it would get some. So that's, that was their tactic at the time. And the Forest Service tried to preempt this by setting aside lands in all sorts of designations. Um, they called them primitive areas, or recreation units, or wilderness areas. But these were purely administrative, and they could be undone by the director of the agency or even by the regional foresters. So the things that we think about today when we think about the Glacier Peak Wilderness Area or the Henry Jackson Wilderness Area, those are wilderness areas created by an act of Congress, 1964 and later. And this, the wilderness areas I'm referring to here the local forester could say, well, we'll just set aside that land for a wilderness area, and we'll just won't allow any logging or anything in there until I decide differently. Um, the Park Service used that approach, used the Forest Service's approach to its advantage, because national parks are established by Congress and, can, and signed into law by the president. They're very difficult to undo. Only a handful have ever been undone. Um, and that pleases preservationists and dismays natural resource constituencies. So that brings us to the New Deal, which is where this story really begins. Um, by the early 1930s, the Forest Service managed more than 8 million acres in Washington state, including much of the Cascade Range and the Olympic Mountains. And we all know that, um, excuse me, 
and the surrounding forest lands. This is uh, Mount Olympus, and at the time there was a national monument at Mount Olympus just called Mount Olympus National Monument. It was managed by the Forest Service. Um, we all know that all of these valleys um, that come down from the Cascades and the watersheds include some of the richest timber stands in the world. The National Park Service had its toehold in Mount Rainier the National Park, but that was it. As noted earlier, other mountains had been proposed for park status, but nothing came of those suggestions. So in 1933, President Roosevelt created the National Resources Board as part of his New Deal reforms. Um, the board was charged with conducting a land use planning study for the entire country. And it recommended that several areas be studied for possible national park status, including the entire Cascade Range in Washington and Oregon. At the same time, the superintendent of Mount Rainier National Park, who's a very experienced Park Service man um, named Owen Tomlinson, was quietly urging his superiors in Washington, D.C. to consider the, quote, outstanding snow peaks and certain rugged wilderness in the Cascades for a five ice peaks national park. That same year, 1933, an executive order transferred all of the national monuments in the United States to the National Park Service, including Mount Olympus. The Forest Service in one fell swoop lost millions of acres of land and administration over dozens of sites. Many of those were in the West. Um, at this point in Washington, the Forest, Forest Service has these primitive and areas, or these areas set aside for recreation. The Whatcom Primitive Area, which is um, essentially the North Cascade slide there, which was between Mount Baker and the Skagit River, about 175,000 acres of some of the most rugged land in Washington state. Very difficult to get to. The Glacier Peak Cascade Recreation Unit, which was all above Timberline, about 235,000 acres, all above Timberline, no forests included at all. The Goat Rocks Primitive Area down by Mount Rainier, about 72,000 acres. And all of those three were created in 1931. And they also had the Mount Baker Recreation Area, which was created in 1926, in direct response to a proposal to make Mount Baker into a national park. Like, oh, you think you want this for a park? We're going to make a recreation area, and we'll set up some skiing and stuff there. Um, but even within the Forest Service, some warned about the agency's half-hearted preservation tactics, noting that the primitive area boundaries leave out every stick of second grade subalpine timber, leaving nothing but the barren mountaintops, and exclude everything that could ever be used for anything else. So they were really just all above timberline there. And what's left, they call the primitive area. So the Forest Service report on their, their own survey recommended that the Whatcom primitive area be expanded from um, 175,000 acres to more than a million acres. And this would have been right at the Canadian border across the North Cascades. The report said, there is growing sentiment among a, num uh, among a considerable portion of the general public which demands the setting aside of primitive areas at all possible points. Although the regional forester was very reluctant, the Whatcom Primitive Area was expanded to about 800,000 acres in 1935 and renamed the North Cascade Primitive Area. So at the same time, it's important to note that all of this is happening well before the Forest Service becomes what I would call an active timber manager. There are plenty of private timberlands in Washington State in the 1930s, and they're all being merrily cut. The, at this point, the Forest Service is still really in its custodial uh, phase. And I just like these pictures because you just forget how big these logs were that were being taken out. Even, just to give you an example, in the 1930s, chainsaws had been invented in the 20s, and they were just coming into widespread use. So this notion of clear cutting or forestry as we think of it today doesn't really exist yet, and the Forest Service is really mostly custodial. Um, and the forests, therefore, are, at least the national forests, are pretty intact at this point. By 1937, both the Park Service and the Forest Service are studying the Cascades. Um, the Park Service, which is keeping to its strategy of asking for big chunks, studied about 5,000 square miles along the Cascade Crest. So here's my hand-drawn map. Someday I'm going to find somebody who knows GPS to make me maps. And this is, so here's the Columbia River, and the top is the border, and here's Mount Adams and Chuckson, here's Glacier Peak, here's Rainier, and St. Helens and Adams. Um, and so you can get an idea, and that the, obviously the, crazy straight squealy lines there are the, the Park Service area that they studied. And it concluded that, the, that an Ice Peak National Park would, 
outrank in its scenic, recreational, and wildlife values any existing national park and any other possibility for such a park within the United States. Not really given to hyperbole, our forest, our park service, but um, there it is. And, and that statement gets, you, gets drawn, quoted over and over and over again. Every time people want to set something aside in the Cascades, you will hear that quote or you'll read it somewhere. So the proposal would have excluded everything below timberline. It was totally a snow and ice and rock proposal. Um, and the forest would have been left open for forest service management and potentially for logging. But Rainier's superintendent, Mount Rainier's superintendent, Owen Tomlinson, who came up with the idea in the first place, warned the Home Office that the proposal would be the most bitterly opposed for park status of any area that is being considered. And the Forest Service essentially thought that idea was absurd for a Cascade Crest Park and figured that the Park Service was up to its old tricks, propose a huge park so it could get some smaller ones later. Some Forest Service staff thought that some areas um, did merit national park status suggesting that Lake Chelan watershed, that northern Lake Chelan watershed be set aside and noting that there was little valuable timber there. Plus, it's really hard to get to, and it still is. Um, but that was sort of their like, oh, well, instead of the whole Cascades, what about just the northern end of Lake Chelan? That was fine. But that was all quiet. That was not public comment. Um, by this point, the dispute is big enough to make some headlines. And an organization called the Washington State Planning Council took notice of it. The Planning Council was created by the legislature in 1934 as part of the national land planning effort, and its mission was to make recommendations on appropriate use of the state's natural resources. As you might expect, the council was dominated by business and industry leaders, and one observer noted that the council always followed the direction given it by the timber industry. So in April 1937, the Planning Council voted to study the Ice Peaks proposal with a view to safeguarding the right to develop natural resources within the boundaries of such a park if established. And then it probably did nothing because the fight over Olympic National Park was reaching a fever pitch. Um, conservationists were working hard to transform Mount Olympus National Monument into a full-fledged park and include the heavily forested valleys around the mountain range, which would remove them both from Forest Service control and from possible harvest. And as we know, the park was established by President Franklin Roosevelt and was actually made larger than the original proposal because FDR felt it was so important to protect those forests. And there's a really excellent and very comprehensive, exhaustive book on the creation of Olympic National Park um, by Karsten Lee and that I recommend if you're interested in that story, it will tell you everything you need to know was created in 1938. Um, in a state still largely dependent on timber, the creation of Olympic National Park and the removal of all those rich rainforests from harvest was a really big deal, and a lot of people were really unhappy about it, including the Planning Council. Although, in reality, and this is where historic hindsight comes in so handy, know that 1937 was just about the last gasp for Washington for its dominance in the timber industry nationally. In 1938, Oregon took over. It produced more board feet than Washington, and that continued all the way up until the current day. I mean, now it's in the south somewhere. But that was the last year that Washington dominated the timber industry. And of course, in World War II, Washington's economy diversified enormously, and, and that impacted it too. So many, including the Planning Council, many people resented what they viewed as heavy-handed tactics by the Secretary of the Interior, who was in charge of the National Park Service, um, Harold Ickes, whose department um, included the Park Service. And during the New Deal, Ickes, um, who thought big, pushed hard for a new Department of Conservation. And he wanted the Forest Service transferred to his new department. So he just wanted all land management agencies. Um, it did not endear him to Forest Service supporters. And in Washington state, he was largely blamed for the creation of Olympic National Park. And just as a tangent, I'll say that the momentum for Olympic, there was local momentum to create a national park on the Olympic Peninsula, mostly based in Seattle. But the real momentum, honestly, came from New York conservationists. So again, read the book. but. It's, it, was, it was something that was an East Coast thing. Um, the Planning Council's response to this was something along the lines of, Harold Ickes will get more Washington land for National Park when pigs fly. Uh, in the meantime, the National Resources Board had released its final report, and it recommended, to no one's surprise, that the Cascade volcanoes and adjacent areas, which display at its best the virgin forest area of the Pacific Northwest, 
be studied for inclusion in the national park system. It basically then established an interagency committee with park and forest service staffers working together to conduct this study. You can already see how that might have turned out. Um, the heads of both agencies ordered their staff to make no public comment, pro or con, about the study or any park proposal, but plenty of private conversations occurred, and there's great, um, in the archives and, there's, uh, and at the State Library, there's great letters back and forth among people. Um, the committee invited, this interagency committee then invited the Planning Council to participate in its study, um, and it accepted that invitation while it continued its own larger investigation. In 1939, the council decided to study all of the land within the five national forests that would be affected, or about 13,000 square miles, about two and a half times the Park Service study area. And the, the planning council study area is up there in green, kind of hard to see. And then you can see that the National Park Service thing looks like just a skinny little area inside of it. But they really wanted to include all the national forests because that was their interest in protecting those natural resources. So they held hearings in Tacoma, Ellensburg, Wenatchee, Yakima, Bellingham, and Longview, all timber towns. And Seattle, which was the center of the pro-Olympic park movement, was glaringly excluded. Representatives from timber, mining, winter sports, grazing, game, testified at every hearing repeatedly against any park along the Cascade Summit Crest, and Olympic was repeatedly and bitterly invoked as an example of what happened when effete Eastern nature lovers had the ear of the president. So no one wanted, and no one really at these hearings wanted more land removed to federal management. This is one of the interesting things you read in these hearings testimony is everyone says, we don't want any more land under federal management. Well, all of the land already was under federal management by the Forest Service. But remember these differences in agency style. The Forest Service was locally managed, locally staffed, decentralized. It didn't feel like the Park Service, which felt like a big federal bureaucracy run by Washington, D.C. insiders. Newspapers uh, gave the hearings heavy coverage, editorializing against the lockup of more natural resources and warning of dire economic consequences for the state. And pretty much only one group was for the proposal, um, something called the Northwest Conservation League. And this was a local chapter of a national group that had fought tenaciously for Olympic, which didn't exactly give it credibility in that crowd. Nonetheless, the league suggested that the park could allow mining to appease resource interests. And you see this again and again in these park proposals. People want a park, and they're willing to give up a lot of what we think of makes a national park in order to get the park in the first place. So they were saying, well, you could mine there. That'd be fine. That wouldn't be invasive. Um, but nonetheless, uh, it also suggested that timber's dominance was waning, and it was correct, and that new economic drivers needed to, do, to be developed for the state. Um, the cachet of a national park would attract tourists, another very consistent argument for creating new, new parks. Um, that argument just didn't hold water with either the council or its constituents. So finally, in 1940, the Park Service submitted its report on the Cascades. It recommended that since the Forest Service already had about 1.8 million acres either reserved from multiple use or planned for reservation for multiple use, those areas should be converted to national park status. And they were the North Fork Nooksack Natural Research Area, which was only 1,500 acres, uh, the Mount Baker Recreation Area, which was created in 1926 and was about 82,000 acres. The North Cascade Primitive Area, which was, had been created in 1931 and expanded in 1935 to about 800,000 acres. The Glacier Peak Limited Area, which had been created in 1931 and then was expanded in um, 1940, but it hadn't been expanded at the time of this proposal. The Natchez Pass Highway Corridor over Mount Rainier and the Goat Rocks Primitive Area, which was about 73,000 acres. So they, they thought 1.8 million acres of land that was already been set aside by the Forest Service had planned for set aside. But they also thought that they should add to that um, Mount St. Helens, before pre-eruption obviously, Mount Adams, Mount Stewart, and the northern end of Lake Chelan, where we're, that all of those areas were worthy of national park status. And it suggested that mining could be allowed in many of the areas to mitigate economic loss and that 25% of park revenues should be returned to adjacent counties. 
The Mount Rainier superintendent privately suggested using recreational development at Grand Coulee Dam as a bargaining chip too. So the dam was built and they were figuring out what to do on Lake Roosevelt behind it. And he said, well, we'll give you Lake Roosevelt if you give us the Cascades. Um, it was a really <laughs> far cry from that original long proposal in the Cascades, although still several million acres. And it put the Forest Service in an awkward position because it now had to reject some of its original glowing assessments about the areas under its jurisdiction. So the Forest Service now said <laughs> that except for the volcanoes, quote, the summit country is scenically dull, uninteresting, and reputedly much inferior to large areas elsewhere in the West. Plus, it was too remote, and the lands contained valuable timber and mineral resources that, although hard to reach now, in 1940, would become more accessible as technology became more advanced. And finally, the Forest Service played the local card, saying that since the areas were already being managed appropriately, why go through the hassle of adding another layer of federal bureaucracy? A few months later, the Planning Council released its report uh, in June 1940, and it published a summary version as a pamphlet and also five, at least 5,000 copies of the full report. And the, both began, the importance of the Cascades to the economic well-being of the state is self-evident. And the rest of the documents were given over to praising the Forest Service and expounding against a national park. Um, the council prepared a radio script that was broadcast on local stations around the state. It sent the report or the pamphlet to newspapers, chambers of commerce, teachers, county governments, banks, businesses, granges, pretty much anyone it could think of that would support its um, position. And that was a majority position. The Park Service reacted quite frostily, noting that the planning council report contained none of the material given it by the Park Service and saying that the council's much larger study area was misleading because the Park Service never wanted all the forest to begin with. To no avail, it didn't matter because the council's report generated statewide support. Hundreds of letters were sent in support of it. Newspapers praised it and so on. And then Secretary Ix, uh, Ickes, he of the Department of Conservation proposal, disavowed any knowledge of a proposed Ice Peaks National Park. He instead, he said the area was only under study. And given that he had been receiving regular updates on Ice Peaks for two years, he had seen a draft bill to create it in 1939 and had received internal, an internal memo about public sentiment against the proposal a month earlier. This was disingenuous at best, but it's politics, and we all, we all know what that's about. So given that its own chief had professed ignorance and confronted by a public that was strongly opposed, the Park Service backed off. And you would think that it would have ended there, but it didn't. In 1940, in, mid, in the middle of the year, right after all this uh, kerfuffle, Mining World magazine published an article that skewered Ickes and the Park Service for their ambition in the Cascades and asked, should conservation serve or only save? The magazine was owned by Miller Freeman. Um, he was a member of the Planning Council, and he was a prominent figure, figure in the state's mining industry. Um, he wrote that the council's study findings were applicable in all western states, and especially those where National Park Service objectives threaten to remove natural resources from their proper use. So Secretary Ickes, who is known for his explosive temper, wrote an irate reply to Freeman's magazine that called the council's study 56 pages of nothing new, reprimanded it for downplaying the National Park Service's stated willingness to allow mining in the, National Park, in the new park, which never made it into the council report. And um, Ickes also excoriated Freeman for his support of the Forest Service's multiple use concept, saying that it was meaningless, didn't, it, it didn't work. So Freeman replied, he printed his letter and Ickes' letter in the next issue, and he replies, frankly, the people of the West have no faith in the National Park Service. And then, as if that wasn't enough, Miller Freeman sent all three pieces to President Roosevelt, saying that Ickes was trying to arbitrarily enforce federal dictatorship and not so subtly suggesting that he be reprimanded for his cheek. Um, Roosevelt replied a month later, supporting his cabinet appointee and suggesting that the planning council was predisposed against the Park Service even before commencing its own study, which of course it was. Um, Freeman elected not to print the president's reply in Mining World. And I just think it's really interesting that a president, a sitting president, running the New Deal, 
uh, looking at entering World War II, would reply to the editor of a mining magazine. And it tells you something. I think it's uh, both today we can't. It'd be like President Obama replying to an editorial in the Seattle Times. It's unlikely. But it tells you something about how powerful the resource industries are in the West at that time and what great concern there is over them. Um, and, and that really, that little dust up was the, the end of the controversy. The superintendent of Mount Rainier, Owen Tomlinson, who'd pushed the ice peak idea in the first place, met with Freeman and Nathan Eckstein, who was another planning council member later in 1940. And if any of you went to Nathan Eckstein Middle School in Seattle, you will know that name. Um, during that meeting, Freeman railed against Icky some more, and uh, Tomlinson described it as a, a tirade against him. But five months later, shortly before the United States entered World War II, Tomlinson wrote to a colleague, uh, my guess is that sometime there will be more of the Cascades given national park status. Comparatively small areas, he added, had always been the aim. And he was right. In the 1950s, a group of conservationists began pushing for the area surrounding Glacier Peak to be preserved. Um, in response to uh, the Forest Service creating cutting circles on the slopes of Glacier Peak and getting ready to um, uh, lease those to timber industries or timber companies for logging. The Forest Service had created a small recreation area on Glacier Peak in 1931. It was about 235,000 acres, and it was purely rock and snow. Um, and in 1939, Bob Marshall, who was the Forest Service's director of recreation and lands, but who most of us know as an ardent conservationist and the co-founder of the Wilderness Society, Marshall recommended expanding um, the Glacier Peak area to almost 800,000 acres, both to preserve the wilderness, but also to preempt the, the Park Service. He was very clear about that. But he died before that goal could be realized. He actually um, died on a train home from visiting the North Cascades in, in 1939, I believe. Unusual. In 1940, the, the Forest Service authorized a somewhat larger Glacier Peak limited area of about 350,000 acres. And in the 1950s, conservationists proposed adding some of the excluded river valleys and expanding the area to about a half a million acres. The Forest Service responded to that proposal with a slightly larger proposal of about 425,000 acres. And that proposal gave birth to the term starfish wilderness or wilderness on the rocks because it so transparently left out the timbered valleys. And if you look at maps of that proposal, which I don't have here, but uh, if you look at maps, it literally looks like a starfish. It just goes down the glacier ridges and that's it. There's no timber. In 1960, the director of the Forest Service established a 450,000 acre wilderness area there, but by then it was too late because uh, conservationists were disillusioned by the Forest Service's response to these proposals to preserve wilderness and they banded together to lobby for a national park in the Cascades. And they ultimately succeeded with the creation of the Glacier Peak Wilderness in 1964. That was one of the first wildernesses established under the Wilderness Act. Um, the North Cascades National Park Complex in 1968 and multiple wilderness areas created since then, including the most recent on uh, the Wild Sky Wilderness areas. And I, this slide is really interesting. It's, a, it's public lands in Washington in 2007. Pretty much everything in green on that map is federally managed. And what's maybe interesting, more interesting about it is that the amount of acreage of federal management in Washington hasn't changed all that significantly in a century. Who manages it has changed. Is it Park Service, is it the Forest Service, is it BLM, is it USGS? But that is pretty much what it's looked like. There's been a little bit of expansion out into the, into the valleys, but I think it's an interesting slide. And of course, Hanford and stuff wasn't, that, that's pretty new. It's always, um, federal government has always had an enormous presence in Washington state in managing its lands. So Ice Peaks, though unsuccessful, does have a few things to teach us. Um, it failed in part because of residual anger over Olympic National Park, which many viewed as taking valuable timber out of production, and it did that. Um, it also failed because the Park Service could not compete with the Forest Service for the affection of Washington citizens. The decentralized bureaucracy of the Forest Service encouraged close relationships between the staff of a given forest and those in the surrounding communities. And when the chips were down on ice peaks, the Forest Service used those relationships to its advantage. In fact, after the Planning Council released its report, the chief of the Forest Service, who's based in Washington, D.C., wrote to the director of the Planning Council, our respective organizations have so much in common 
so many similar objectives and ideals that any type of relationship other than the friendly and cooperative one which now exists would be quite unthinkable. That relationship did remain close, but public support for the Forest Service eroded over the next two decades, paving the way for the Park Service to try again in the Cascades, this time successfully with North Cascades. Thank you. <laughs>